Progress Report 12, June 5th. Nemor is upset because I haven't turned in any progress reports in almost two weeks. And he's justified because the Wellberg Foundation has begun paying me a salary out of the grant so that I won't have to look for a job. The International Psychological Convention at Chicago is only a week away. He wants his preliminary report to be as full as possible, since Algernon and I are the prime exhibits for his presentation. Our relationship is becoming increasingly strained. I resent Nemours' constant references to me as a laboratory specimen. He makes me feel that before the experiment, I was not really a human being. I told Strauss that I was too involved in thinking, reading, and digging into myself, trying to understand who and what I am, and that writing was such a slow process, it made me impatient to get my ideas down. I followed his suggestion that I learn to type, and now that I can type nearly 75 words a minute, it's easier to get it all down on paper. Strauss again brought up my need to speak and write simply and directly so that people will understand me. He reminds me that language is sometimes a barrier instead of a pathway. Ironic to find myself on the other side of the intellectual fence. I see Alice occasionally, but we don't discuss what happened. Our relationship remains platonic. But for three nights after I left the bakery, there were night the nightmares. Hard to believe it was two weeks ago. I am pursued down the empty streets at night by ghostly figures. Though I always run to the bakery, the door is locked, and the people inside never turn to look at me. Through the window, the bride and groom on the wedding cake point at me and laugh. The air becomes charged with laughter until I can't stand it, and the two cupids wave their flaming arrows. I scream, I pound on the door, but there is no sound. I see Charlie staring back at me from inside. Is it only a reflection? Things clutch at my legs and drag me away from the bakery down into the shadows of the alleyway, and just as they begin to ooze all over me, I wake up. Other times, the window of the bakery opens into the past, and looking through it, I see other things and other people. It's astonishing how my power of recall is developing. I cannot control it completely yet, but sometimes when I'm busy reading or working on a problem, I get a feeling of intense clarity. I know it's some kind of subconscious warning signal, and now, instead of waiting for the memory to come to me, I close my eyes and reach out for it. Eventually, I'll be able to bring this recall completely under control to explore not only the sum of my past experiences, but also all of the untapped faculties of the mind. Even now, as I think about it, I feel a sharp stillness. I see the bakery window, reach out and touch it, cold and vibrating, and then the glass becomes warm, hotter, fingers burning. The window reflecting my image becomes bright, and as the glass turns into a mirror, I see little Charlie Gordon, 14 or 15, looking out at me through the window of his house, and it's doubly strange to realize how different he was. He has been waiting for his sister to come from school, and when he sees her turn the corner onto Mark Street, he waves and calls her name and runs out onto the porch to meet her. Norma waves a paper. I got an A in my history test. I knew all the answers. Mrs. Baffin said it was the best paper in the whole class. She is a pretty girl with light brown hair, carefully braided, and coiled about her head in a crown. And as she looks up at her big brother, the smile turns to a frown, and she skips away, leaving him behind as she darts up the steps into the house. Smiling, he follows her. His mother and father are in the kitchen. And Charlie, bursting with the excitement of Norma's good news, blurts it out before she has a chance. She got an A! She got an A! No! shrieks Norma. Not you! You don't tell! It's my mark, and I'm gonna tell! Now wait a minute, young lady. Matt puts his newspaper down and addresses her sternly. That's no way to talk to your brother. He had no right to tell. Never mind. Matt glares at her over his warning finger. He meant no harm by it, and you mustn't shout at him that way. She turns to her mother for support. I got an A, the best mark in class. Now can I have a dog? You promised. You said if I got a good mark in the test, and I got an A. A brown dog with white spots, and I'm going to call him Napoleon because that was the question I answered best on the test. Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo. Rose nods. Go out on the porch and play with Charlie. He's been waiting over an hour for you to come home from school. I don't want to play with him. Go out on the porch, says Matt. Norma looks at her father and then at Charlie. I don't have to. Mother says I don't have to play with him if I don't want to. Now, young lady, Matt rises out of his chair and comes towards her. You just apologize to your brother. I don't have to, she screeches, rushing behind her mother's chair. He's like a baby. He can't play Monopoly or checkers or anything. He gets everything all mixed up. 
I won't play with him anymore. Then go to your room. Can I have a dog now, Mama? Matt hits the table with his fist. There'll be no dog in this house as long as you take this attitude, young lady. I promised her a dog if she did well in school. A brown one with spots, adds Norma. Matt points to Charlie standing near the wall. Did you forget you told your son he couldn't have one because we didn't have the room and no one to take care of it? Remember when he asked for a dog? Are you going back on what you said to him? But I can take care of my own dog, insists Norma. I'll feed him and wash him and take him out. Charlie, who has been standing near the table, playing with his large red button at the end of a string, suddenly speaks out. I'll help her take care of the dog. I'll help her feed it and brush it, and I won't let the other dogs bite it. But before either Matt or Rose can answer, Norma shrieks, No! It's going to be my dog. Only my dog. Matt nods. You see? Rose sits beside her and strokes her braids to calm her. But we have to share things, dear. Charlie can help you take care of it. No, only mine. I'm the one who got the A in history, not him. He never gets good marks like me. Why should he help with the dog? And then the dog will like him more than me, and it will be his dog instead of mine. No, if I can't have it for myself, I don't want it. That settles it, says Matt, picking up his newspaper and settling down in his chair again. No dog. Suddenly, Norma jumps off the couch and grabs the history test she has brought home so eagerly just a few minutes earlier. She tears it and throws the pieces into Charlie's startled face. I hate you. I hate you. Norma, stop that at once. Rose grabs her, but she twists away. And I hate school. I hate it. I'll stop studying and I'll be a dummy like him. I'll forget everything I learned and then I'll be just like him. She runs out of the room shrieking. It's happening to me already. I'm forgetting everything. I'm forgetting. I don't remember anything I learned anymore. Rose, terrified, runs after her. Matt sits there staring at the newspaper in his lap. Charlie, frightened by the hysteria and the screaming, shrinks into a chair, whimpering softly. What has he done? And feeling the wetness in his trousers and the trickling down his leg, he sits there waiting for the slap he knows will come when his mother returns. The scene fades. But from that time, Norma spent all her free moments with her friends or playing alone in her room. She kept the door to her room closed and I was forbidden to enter without her permission. I recall once hearing Norma and one of her girlfriends playing in her room and Norma shouting, he's not my real brother. He's just a boy we took in because we felt sorry for him. My, my mama told me and she said I can tell everyone now that he's not really my brother at all. I wish this memory was a photograph so that I could tear it up and throw it back into her face. I want to call back across the years and tell her I never meant to stop her from getting her dog. She could have had it all to herself, and I wouldn't have fed it or brushed it or played with it. And I would never have made it like me more than it liked her. I only wanted her to play games with me the way we used to. I never meant to do anything that would hurt her at all. June 6. My first real quarrel with Alice today. My fault. I wanted to see her. Often, after a disturbing memory or dream, talking to her, just being with her, makes me feel better. But it was a mistake to go down to the center to pick her up. I had not been back to the center for retarded adults since the operation, and the thought of seeing the place was exciting. It's on 23rd Street, east of 5th Avenue, in an old schoolhouse that has been used by the Beekman University Clinic for the last five years as a center for experimental education, special classes for the handicapped. The sign outside in the doorway, framed by the old spike gateway, is just a gleaming brass plate that says CRA Beekman Extension. Her class ended at 8, but I wanted to see the room where, not so long ago, I had struggled over simple reading and writing and learned to count change of a dollar. I went inside, slipped up to the door, and, keeping out of sight, I looked through the window. Alice was at her desk, and in a chair beside her was a thin-faced woman I didn't recognize. She was frowning that open frown of unconcealed puzzlement, and I wondered what Alice was trying to explain. Near the blackboard was Mike Dorney in his wheelchair, and there in his usual first row first, first seat was Lester Braun, who, Alice said, was the smartest in the group. Lester had learned easily what I had struggled over, but he came when he felt like it, or he stayed away to earn money waxing floors. I guess if he had cared at all, if it had been important to him as it was to me, they would have used him for this experiment. There were new faces, too, people I didn't know. Finally, I got up the nerve to go in. It's Charlie, said Mike, whirling his wheelchair around. I waved to him. 
Bernice, the pretty blonde with empty eyes, looked up and smiled dully. Where you been, Charlie? That's a nice suit. The others who remembered me waved to me, and I waved back. Suddenly, I could see by Alice's expression that she was annoyed. It's almost eight o'clock, she announced. Time to put things away. Each person had an assigned task, the putting away of chalk, erasers, papers, books, pencils, no paper, paints, and demonstration material. Each one knew his job and took pride in doing it well. They all started on their tasks except Bernice. She was staring at me. Why ain't Charlie been coming to school? asked Bernice. What's the matter, Charlie? Are you coming back? The others looked up at me. I looked to Alice, waiting for her to answer for me, and there was a long silence. What could I tell them that would not hurt them? This is just a visit, I said. One of the girls started to giggle. Francine, whom Alice was always worried about. She had given birth to three children by the time she was 18, before her parents arranged for a hysterectomy. She wasn't pretty, not nearly as attractive as Bernice, but she had been an easy mark for dozens of men who brought her something pretty or paid her way to the movies. She lived at a boarding house approved for outside work trainees by the Warren State Home and was permitted out in the evenings to come to the center. Twice she hadn't shown up, picked up by men on the way to school, and now she was allowed out only with an escort. He talks like a big shot now, she giggled. All right, said Alice, breaking in sharply. Class dismissed. I'll see you all tomorrow night at six. When they were gone, I could see by the way she was slamming her own things into her closet that she was angry. I'm sorry, I said. I was going to wait for you downstairs, and then I got curious about the old classroom, my alma mater. I just wanted to look through the window, and before I knew what I was doing, I came in. What's bothering you? Nothing. Nothing's bothering me. Come on. Your anger is all out of proportion to what's happened. Something's on your mind. She slammed down a book she was holding. All right. You want to know? You're different. You've changed. And I'm not talking about your IQ. It's your attitude toward people. You're not the same kind of human being. Oh, come on now. Don't, don't interrupt me. The real anger in her voice pushed me back. I mean it. There was something in you before. I don't know. A warmth, an openness, a kindness that made everyone like you and like to have you around. Now, with all your intelligence and knowledge, there are differences that I couldn't let myself listen. What did you expect? Did you think I'd remain a docile pup, wagging my tail and licking the foot that kicks me? Sure, all this has changed me in the way I think about myself. I no longer have to take the kind of crap that people have been handing me all my life. People have not been bad to you. What do you know about it? Listen, the best of them have been smug and patronizing, using me to make themselves superior and secure in their own limitations. Anyone can feel intelligent beside a moron. After I said it, I knew she was going to take it the wrong way. You put me in that category, too, I suppose. Don't be absurd. You know damn well I... Of course, in a sense, I guess you're right. Next to you, I am rather dull-witted. Nowadays, every time we see each other, after I leave you, I go home with the miserable feeling that I'm slow and dense about everything. I review things I've said and come up with all the bright and witty things I should have said, and I feel like kicking myself because I didn't mention them when we were together. That's a common experience. I find myself wanting to impress you in a way I never thought about doing before. But being with you has undermined my self-confidence. I question my motives now about everything I do. I tried to get her off the subject, but she kept coming back to it. Look, I didn't come here to argue with you, I finally said. Will you let me take you home? I need someone to talk to. So do I. But these days, I can't talk to you. All I can do is listen and nod my head and pretend I understand all about cultural variance and neo boulan mathematics and post-symbolic logic, and I feel more and more stupid. And when you leave the apartment, I have to stare in the mirror and scream at myself. No, you're not growing duller every day. You're not losing your intelligence. You're not getting senile and dull-witted. It's Charlie's exploding forward so quickly that it makes it appear as if you're slipping backwards. I say that to myself, Charlie. But whenever we meet and you tell me something and look at me in that impatient way, I know you're laughing. And when you explain things to me and I can't remember them, you think it's because I'm not interested and don't want to take the trouble, but you don't know how I torture myself when you're gone. You don't know the books I've struggled over, the lectures I've sat in on at Beekman, and yet whenever I talk about something, I see how impatient you are, as if it were all childish. I wanted you to be intelligent. I wanted to help you and share with you, and now you've shut me out of your life. 
As I listened to what she was saying, the enormity of it dawned on me. I had been so absorbed in myself and what was happening to me that I never thought about what was happening to her. She was crying silently as we left the school, and I found myself without words. All during the ride on the bus, I thought to myself how upside down the situation had become. She was terrified of me. The ice had broken between us, and the gap was widening as the current of my mind carried me swiftly into the open sea. She was right in refusing to torture herself by being with me. We no longer had anything in common. Simple conversation had become strained, and all there was between us now was the embarrassed silence and unsatisfied longing in a darkened room. You're very serious, she said, breaking out of her own mood and looking up at me. About us. It shouldn't make you so serious. I don't want to upset you. You're going through a great trial. She was trying to smile. But you did. Only, I don't know what to do about it. On the way from the bus stop to her apartment, she said, I'm not going to the convention with you. I called Professor Nemo this morning and told him. There will be a lot for you to do there. Interesting people, the excitement of the spotlight for a while. I don't want to be in the way. Alice, and no matter what you say about it now, I know that's how I'm going to feel. So if you don't mind, I'll hang on to my splintering ego. Thank you. But you're making more of this than it is. I'm sure I feel just, you know? You're sure? She turned and glared at me on the front steps of her apartment building. Oh, how insufferable you've become. How do you know what I feel? You take liberties with other people's minds. You can't tell how I feel or what I feel or why I feel. She started inside, and then she looked back at me, her voice shaky. I'll be here when you get back. I'm just upset, that's all, and I want both of us to have a chance to think this out while we're at a good distance apart. For the first time in many weeks, she didn't ask me inside. I stared at the closed door with the anger mounting inside me. I wanted to create a scene, to bang on the door, to break it down. I wanted my anger to consume the building. But as I walked away, I felt a kind of simmering, then cooling, and finally a relief. I walked so fast I was drifting along the streets, and the feeling that hit my cheek was a cool breeze out of the summer night, suddenly free. I realize now that my feeling for Alice had been moving backward against the current of my learning, from worship to love to fondness, to a feeling of gratitude and responsibility. My confused feeling for her had been holding me back, and I had clung to her out of my fear of being forced out on my own and cut adrift. But with the freedom came a sadness. I wanted to be in love with her. I wanted to overcome my emotional and sexual fears, to marry, have children, and settle down. Now it's impossible. I'm just as far away from Alice with an IQ of 185 as I was when I had an IQ of 70. And this time we both know it. June 8th. What drives me out of the apartment to prowl through the city? I wander through the streets alone, not the relaxing stroll of a summer night, but the tense hurry to get where? Down alleyways, looking into doorways, peering into half-shuttered windows, wanting someone to talk to and yet afraid to meet anyone. Up one street and down another, through the endless labyrinth, hurling myself against the neon cage of the city. Searching for what? I met a woman in Central Park. She was sitting on a bench near the lake with a coat clutched around her despite the heat. She smiled and motioned for me to sit beside her. We would looked at the bright skyline on Central Park South, the honeycomb of lighted cells against the blackness and I wished I could absorb them all. Yes, I told her I was from New York. No, I had never been to Newport News, Virginia. That's where she was from, and where she had married the sailor who was at sea now, and she hadn't seen him in two and a half years. She twisted and knotted a handkerchief, using it from time to time to wipe the beaded sweat from her forehead. Even in the dim light reflected from the lake, I could see that she wore a great deal of makeup, but she looked attractive with her straight dark hair loose to her shoulders except that her face was puffy and swollen, as if she had just gotten up from sleep. She wanted to talk about herself, and I wanted to listen. Her father had given her a good home, an education, everything a wealthy shipbuilder could give his only daughter, but not forgiveness. He would never forgive her elopement with the sailor. She took my hand as she spoke and rested her head on my shoulder. The night Gary and I were married, she whispered, I was a terrified virgin, and he just went crazy, First he had to slap me and beat me, and then he took me with no love-making. That was the last time we were ever together, 
I never let him touch me again. She could probably tell by the trembling of my hand that I was startled. It was too violent and intimate for me. Feeling my hand stir, she gripped it tighter, as if she had to finish her story before she could let me go. It was important to her, and I sat quietly as one sits before a bird that feeds from your palm. Not that I don't like men, she assured me with wide-eyed openness. I've been with other men. Not him, but lots of others. Most men are gentle and tender with a woman. They make love slowly, with caresses and kisses first. She looked at me meaningfully, and let her open palm brush back and forth against mine. It was what I had heard about, read about, dreamed about. I didn't know her name, and she didn't ask mine. She just wanted me to take her someplace where we could be alone. I wondered what Alice would think. I caressed her awkwardly and kissed her still more hesitantly so that she looked up at me. What's the matter, she whispered. What are you thinking? About you. Do you have a place we can go? Each step forward was caution. At what point would the ground give way and plunge me into anxiety? Something kept me moving ahead to test my footing. If you don't have a place, the mansion hotel on 53rd doesn't cost too much and they don't bother you about luggage if you pay in advance. I have a room. She looked at me with new respect. Well, that's fine. Still nothing. And that in itself was curious. How far could I go without being overwhelmed by symptoms of panic? When we were alone in the room? When she undressed? When I saw her body? When we were lying together? Suddenly, it was important to know if I could be like other men. If I could ever ask a woman to share life with me. Having intelligence and knowledge wasn't enough. I wanted this, too. The sense of release and looseness was strong now with the feeling that it was possible. The excitement that came over me when I kissed her again communicated itself, and I was sure I could be normal with her. She was different from Alice. She was the kind of woman who had been around. Then her voice changed, uncertain. Before we go, just one thing. She stood up and took a step toward me in the spray of lamplight, opening her coat, and I could see the shape of her body as I had not imagined it all the time we were sitting next to each other in the shadows. Only the fifth month, she said. It doesn't make any difference. You don't mind, do you? Standing there with her coat open, she was superimposed as a double exposure on the picture of the middle-aged woman just out of the bathtub, holding open her bathrobe for Charlie to see. And I waited, as a blast from her waits for lightning. I looked away. It was the last thing I had expected, but the coat wrapped tightly around her on such a hot night should have warned me that something was wrong. It's not my husband, she assured me. I wasn't lying to you about what I said before. I haven't seen him for years. It was a salesman I met about eight months ago. I was living with him. I'm not going to see him anymore, but I'm going to keep the baby. We've just got to be careful, not rough or anything like that but otherwise you don't have to worry. Her voice ran down when she saw my anger. That's filthy, I shouted. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. She drew away, wrapping her coat quickly around her to protect what lay within. As she made that protective gesture, I saw the second double image. My mother, heavy with my sister, in the days when she was holding me less, warming me less with her voice and touch, protecting me less against anyone who dared to say I was subnormal. I think I grabbed her shoulder, I'm not sure, but then she was screaming, and I was sharply back to reality with the sense of danger. I wanted to tell her I had meant no harm. I would never hurt her or anyone. Please, don't scream. But she was screaming, and I heard the running footsteps on the darkened path. This was something no one would understand. I ran into the darkness to find an exit from the park, zigzagging across one path and down another. I didn't know the park, and suddenly I crashed into something that threw me backwards a wire mesh fence, a dead end. Then I saw the swings and slides and realized it was a children's playground locked up for the night. I followed the fence and kept going, half running, stumbling over twisted roots. At the lake that curved around near the playground, I doubled back, found another path, went over the small footbridge and then around and under it. No exit. What is it? What happened, lady? A maniac. You all right? Which way did he go? I had circled back to where I had started from. I slipped behind the huge outcropping of a rock and a screen of bramble and dropped flat on my stomach. Get a cop. There's never a cop when you need one. What happened? A degenerate tried to rape her. 
Hey, some guy down there is chasing him. There he goes. Come on, get the bastard before he gets out of the park. Careful, he's got a knife and a gun. It was obvious that the shouting had flushed out the night crawlers because the cry of, there he goes, was echoed from behind me. And looking out from behind the rock, I could see a lone runner being chased down the lamplit path into the darkness. Seconds later, another one passed in front of the rock and disappeared into the shadows. I pictured myself being caught by this eager mob and beaten and torn by them. I deserved it. I almost wanted it. I stood up, pressed the leaves and dirt from my clothing, and walked slowly down the path in the direction from which I had come. I expected every second to be grabbed from behind and pulled down into the dirt and darkness. But soon I saw the bright lights of 59th Street and 5th Avenue, and I came out of the park. Thinking about it now in the security of my room, I am shaken with the rawness that touched me. Remembering how my mother looked before she gave birth to my sister is frightening. But even more frightening is the feeling that I wanted them to catch me and beat me. Why did I want to be punished? Shadows out of the past clutch at my legs and drag me down. I open my mouth to scream, but I am voiceless. My hands are trembling. I feel cold, and there is a distant humming in my ears.